you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 30. To celebrate Canada Day on July 1st, we're chatting about Canadian wine today, including some colorful history and surprising facts that you can drop casually at your barbecue gathering as you crack open a bottle. I'll also tell you how you can get a shopping list of my favorite Canadian wines that are in stores now near the end of the show. So stick with me. Now, before we dive in, I'd like to give a shout out to David Klein from New York City, who emailed me to say, quote, I just wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed your podcast number 26. It was about wine during wartime. The podcast was very informative, and you have a pleasant quality in your voice. Thank you again for a great presentation, end quote. Well, thank you, David. I'm so glad you enjoyed that episode, and thank you for the kind words about my voice. Yay! <laughs> if you're a history buff like David and you missed that one, go back and take a listen. As he said, it's number 26. There are lots of interesting stories, especially about the French winemakers who hid the stocks of their best wines from the invading Germans during World War II, even setting down spiders in front of new walls to spin webs to make them look old. You just gotta love the creativity. I love sharing reviews of this podcast for those of you kind enough to post them, especially on Apple Podcasts, formerly iTunes, where others can see them. You can also email me or tag me on social media. If you want me to mention your website or social media handle, please include that in your review along with your name. I want to celebrate you and let others know how to connect with you online. So here we go. Canada has a long history with the grape. Viking Leif Erikson first named the country Vineland in 1001 BCE when he discovered so many vines growing in Newfoundland. In 1535, French explorer Jacques Cartier found so many grapes growing in Quebec's Ile d'Orleans that he named it Ile de Bacchus, after the Greek god of wine. But let's skip ahead to more recent times. Can you remember when Canadian wines sounded more like a trip to the zoo than something you'd actually put on the table? There was Gimli Goose, Pink Flamingo, Little White Duck, Fuddle Duck, Love a Duck, Pussycat, Baby Deer, Baby Bear, and everyone's favorite, Baby Duck. Some of us still remember the nasty hangover those simple sweet wines made in the 1970s and 80s gave us. And if you don't remember these wines, you either had too much of them or you were born after they exited the market. Lucky you. Happily, this Venus menagerie has gone the way of long sideburns and large lapels, replaced with delicious modern wines. Now, before I share with you just how that remarkable transformation happened, let's play the wine version of Jeopardy, shall we? I call it the Great Canadian Wine Quiz. Test your Venus savvy with the following questions to see how much you know about red, white, and booze. Question number one. Which famous Canadian comedian owns a Canadian winery? Is it Mike Myers, Dan Aykroyd, Justin Trudeau, or Rich Little? It's Dan Aykroyd. Two. What does VQA stand for? Is it Vintner's Question Authority, Vineyard's Quality Assurance, Vintner's Quality Alliance, or Vincu Alemang. It's Vintner's Quality Alliance. The father of Canadian wine is known as Johann Schiller, 
John Niagara, Johnny Grapeseed, or Gordon Lightfoot? It's Johann Schiller. Many Canadian winemakers make extensive use of oak aging, carbonic maceration, hand harvesting of grapes, or Prozac. (laughs) It's actually hand harvesting of grapes. Don't know about the Prozac. Probably at round harvest, actually. Number five. There are how many wineries in Canada? 2,000? 700? 450? Or 300? It's 700. The first commercial winery in Canada opened in 1866, 1889, 1936, or 1975. It's 1866. The largest producer of ice wine in the world is Alaska, Canada, Germany, or Iceland. It's Canada. Approximately what percentage of the current price of wine in Canada is government taxes? Is it 45%, 60%, 75%, or 90%? It's 60%. Which of the following does not belong? Prince Edward County, Niagara Peninsula, Lake Erie North Shore, or Thunder Bay? It's Thunder Bay. Grapes for ice wines are picked at which temperature? Below minus 8 degrees Celsius? Below freezing? Below 8 degrees Celsius? Or any nippy winter night? It's below minus 8 degrees Celsius. White Zinfandel is made from which of the following? Red Zinfandel grapes? A blend of Chardonnay and Zinfandel? traditional rosé grapes, an industrial premix solution. It's an industrial... No, it's not. It's red Zinfandel grapes. What is noble rot? Grapes damaged by cold temperatures? When good wine is left in poor storage conditions? A benevolent fungus that attacks grapes, which can result in sweet wine but not ice wine? When good winemakers go bad? Noble rot is a benevolent fungus. Which hockey player has his name on a Canadian bottle of wine? Is it Mario Lemieux, Wayne Gretzky, Mark Messier, or Sidney Crosby? It's Wayne Gretzky. Which of the following of these is not a Canadian winery? Is it dirty laundry, organized crime, laughing stock? Or Vine and Punishment? It's Vine and Punishment. I'd like to start that one, actually. Number 15. What factor contributes most to the loss of grapes for ice wine? Is it predators such as birds and deer? Mold, mildew, and rot? Government bureaucrats? Or temperatures too warm to harvest? It's predators such as birds and deer. Ontario produces what percentage of Canadian wines? Is it 25%, 55%, 75%, or 90%? It's 55%. And finally, Niagara lies on the same latitude as Bordeaux, Burgundy, Alsace, or Champagne. It's Burgundy. All right, hope you had fun with that. Let me know how you did. Email me, tag me on social media, I'd love to know. So even though we may be past the zoological phase, Canadian wines still suffer from what I call the Celine Dion Shania Twain syndrome. Sometimes it requires international acclaim before you're fully embraced at home. Canadian wines have indeed made it on the world stage. Niagara's Inniskillen Estates first brought international recognition to the country when it's 1989 Vidal Ice Wine won France's 1991 Grand Prix d'Honneur in a blind tasting against more than 4,000 of the world's best wines. Since then, Canadian wineries have racked up the awards. And here are a few more reasons why we should drink Canadian wines now and several reasons why we still don't. Number one, wide selection. 
Choice really isn't a problem with 700 wineries in six provinces, producing the equivalent of 257 million bottles worth $1.24 billion every year. Canadian vintners now make a wide range of styles, from dry red and white table wines to bubbly and dessert wine. Number two, improved taste and quality. Canada has benefited from improved winemaking technology and techniques that vintners around the world now use. Our wines also naturally complement our cuisine because the raw ingredients spring from the same soil and have the same cultural influences. And three, excellent value. Since Canadian wines are still trying to fight old stereotypes, they haven't escalated in price to the extent that more fashionable wines from California and Tuscany and Bordeaux, for example, have over the past five to ten years. Local wines also don't have import taxes and long-haul shipping costs. In some cases, the provincial liquor stores give consumers a small break on prices. In Ontario, for example, provincial wines are marked up by 58%, compared to those from outside the province and country at 64%. So if all of this is true, why is only one-third of the wine that we buy in Canada Canadian? Number one, not enough marketing. Aside from breaking the old stereotypes of Canadian wine, our country's vintners face daunting competition from foreign competitors. It's hard to compete with the much larger marketing budgets of New World producers or the subsidies for those from the Old World. For example, New World regions such as Australia and California and Old World regions such as France and Italy have budgets large enough to finance full-time staff in Canada just to market their wines here. Number two, lack of availability. The Liquor Control Board of Ontario, the LCBO for example, is the single largest purchaser of alcohol in the world, but many Canadian wineries don't produce enough wine to satisfy its requirements, i.e. having enough volume to stock all of its shelves. That's the case with other provincial liquor stores as well. The reason? We'll just take a comparison. BC has about 5,000 acres of vines planted, whereas Australia has close to 400,000. The challenge is small production, and the fact that about 90% of BC wine, for example, is consumed in BC. It's just more profitable to sell wine inside your own province than it is to sell it to other provinces. Markups are more the issue. Wineries will tell you that markups that liquor boards have in place make selling in those markets not very profitable. The provincial liquor boards in turn must balance business objectives, such as turning over a certain amount of tax revenue to the government while supporting domestic wines. The hot button issue, though, continues to be the barriers to buying and shipping wine between provinces. While the federal government has enacted legislation to free trade, a number of provinces have not. In fact, it's been proven easier to buy a handgun and ship it across the country than it is a bottle of Merlot. You can find more information on this issue at freemygrapes.ca. I'll put the link also in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 30. Number three, lack of national standards. Although the Vintners Quality Alliance, VQA, provides quality standards for wineries volunteering to adopt them, there is no national quality standard imposed on Canadian producers that is similar to France's Appellation d'Origine Contrôlé, or AOC and other European wine systems. A lack of a national standard impedes a coherent domestic marketing strategy. There is no one simple logo that consumers can trust when it comes to buying Canadian wine. And while a national standard won't guarantee that all Canadian wine would taste great, raising the base quality level would increase our odds of buying a better bottle and our confidence in doing so. Currently, these standards are being worked on by the Canadian Vintners Association with the Provincial Wine Councils. So, what can you do? Well, start by buying Canadian wines. 
you'll find reviews to thousands of Canadian wines on my website at nataliemcclain.com, and I'll put a link in the show notes that take you right to the search results that bring up those reviews. Each review will also tell you which liquor store closest to you has that wine in stock right now, as well as the winery's own website so that you can order it directly if you prefer. And again, that will be at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 30. Now, according to Dan Paskowski, president of the Canadian Vintners Association, which is an Ottawa-based industry lobby group that I mentioned, every bottle of 100% Canadian wine sold in Canada injects $89.99 of economic impact to the national economy through jobs, tourism, and the wine industry itself, as compared to just $15.73 for an imported bottle of wine. That's amazing. The Canadian wine industry provided a total of $9 billion of economic impact to the national economy and 37,300 full-time equivalent jobs every year, as well as attracting almost 4 million tourists, which contributes another $1.5 billion to the national economy. So in addition to drinking Canadian wine this summer, why not visit one of our wine regions? Most of these wineries are nestled in spectacular settings, and their wines pair wonderfully well with the local cuisine, making the trip a gastronomic delight. A number of wineries also have spectacular restaurants that pair their wine with local delicacies. These regions also offer lots of activities apart from visiting the tasting rooms, from bike tours to balloon rides. Fun for all the family! I'll include links in the show notes where you can find more on traveling to these regions. This Canada Day, and all year round, let's dig down into our roots. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you do, please tell one friend about it. Just one, especially someone who's interested in Canadian wines. My podcast is easy to find. Just search Google for it, Unreserved Wine Talk, or search on my name. You can also tag me on Twitter or Facebook at Natalie McLean, or on Instagram, I'm at Natalie McLean Wine. As I mentioned, you'll find all the links, the wine reviews, the resources, the travel tips in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 30. Finally, if you want to take your wine and food pairing to the next level, join me in a free online video wine class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash class. I can't wait to share more personal wine stories with you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this one. I hope something great is in your glass this week. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.